Good morning, good morning, everyone. Welcome to CIA Church. It's good to see your lovely faces this morning. Um, and those who are joining us online, welcome as well. We are going to get into a time of worship. We're going to get into a time of praise. Uh, so if you could get up and join us, and let's just sing praise into our heart together this morning. Amen. song called it's just a declaration that we stand before you God we give you all our praise our lives belong to him amen and now we're just going to give him 
all the praise. Everything is different. Whatever it is you brought in that is on your head that you're thinking about, give it unto the Lord this morning in praise because everything is different because he's here with us. Amen. Amen. I stand before you, Lord, and give you all my praise. Your love is all I need. Jesus, you're all I need. My life belongs to you. Your grace is all I need. Your grace is all I need. Jesus, you're all I need. Hold me in your arms. Never let me go. I want to spend church this morning just focus on Jesus. He's the one we're singing to this morning. He's the one we need for everything that we're going through. So we're going to lift his name up.
because we are singing from a place of victory. How many know we have victory in Jesus? Thank you, God. We have victory in Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. 
exalted, and you reign. You're worthy of all the praise and all of the glory and of all of the honor. Lord, we thank you for your peace. We thank you for your grace. Thank you for who you are, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We're going to get ready to go into a time of communion, and I'm going to invite Mr. Chris and Ms. Melissa Butcher down to come and help us. Now, as we get ready to go into this time of communion, we do this every month here at CIAG. Let me just encourage you to take this time before we go into the next worship song, as Chris and Melissa come and they begin to distribute the elements of communion. Let me just encourage you this morning to take this time to self-reflect, self-examine. And before we take the communion, I'm going to just give a few thoughts for us on the meaning of, uh, of communion, the significance behind it, and how it's a way for us to do exactly that, to commune, to come together, to celebrate the death and the resurrection of Christ. So would you take a minute as we go into this next worship song to self-examine, to just speak to God. Prayer is just a conversation to God. Would you begin to ask the Lord like David did to search my heart, O oh God. Know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Purify me, Lord. And draw me close to your presence this morning. Chris, Melissa, please, you can go ahead and begin distributing the elements. Worship along with us as we go into this next song this morning. Lord 
you're worthy. that we are. Thank you, Lord. It says, Jesus says to us when we come to this communion table, he says to do this in remembrance of me. What does he mean by this? Do this. Celebrate together. This is a time of celebration, of relationship, our personal relationship with Christ Jesus. Communion is a time for us to do three things. It's a time for us to examine, examine our lives and say, Lord, is my lifestyle contrary to your word? And if it is, Lord, would you forgive me? Would you help me to repent, to turn and to commit myself to you? We examine. The second part of it is we confess. We confess if there's anything in our hearts, anything in our lives, God, that is offensive. God, would you forgive us for it? Would you purify? And we don't stop there, but after we examine, after we confess, then we celebrate. What are we celebrating in communion? We celebrate the resurrection of Christ Jesus. If Jesus went to the cross and he did not resurrect, there's no power in our faith. The faith the power and the faith comes in the resurrection of Christ. He died for us. He paid the price for all of our sins. But then he came to life. And he said, you now have this life. So we celebrate that life. How many are grateful for a new life in Christ Jesus? Amen. So go ahead and grab your uh, communion cups. Your, uh, you know, it could be a little bit tricky. So the very top one, it opens. There's two little slips there. The very top one opens the bread the bottom one opens the wine now it says in the book of matthew chapter 26 jesus is this is the last supper this is the last dinner that he had with his uh, disciples and he says this to them he says while they were eating jesus he took bread and when he had given thanks for the bread he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying take and eat for this is my body what this little wafer represents this morning, this little wafer, this little piece of bread, it represents the body of Christ that was broken for us on the cross. What it represents, it's, a, it's symbolic of if there's anything broken in our lives, Christ can make it whole. Amen? As we take this bread, let it be a time for us to remember and celebrate his healing and his touch in our lives. Now, this is an open communion. As long as you have a relationship with the Lord, we welcome you. You don't have to be a part of this church. We welcome you to join in with us. Can we take this bread together this morning? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that your body was broken on the cross for us, Lord, that you paid the price for us, God. While we were yet still sinners, Lord, you came and you died for us. He goes on to say in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 27, Jesus says, Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, to his disciples, and he said, Drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Now, this is symbolic. This is symbolic, this wine, this juice, it, it's symbolic of the blood that was shed for us. You know, sometimes we don't, it can be a little uncomfortable talking about the blood of Jesus. What is that? It could seem a little weird, but the blood is the only thing that restores us to God. Because in order for our sins to be forgiven, there needed to have been a blood sacrifice. And Jesus gave us that sacrifice. The blood, there's an old hymn that says the blood will never lose its power. I don't know about you, but the blood of Jesus has never failed me. It's never failed to cleanse me, to purify me, to restore me, to encourage me. And this is what we celebrate today. So Jesus says, take this cup, drink of it, for this is my life that is being given to you. Let's drink of the cup this morning.
Lord, we thank you, God. We thank you for your grace and your mercy, God. We thank you that you gave your life up for us, Jesus. Lord, we thank you, God, that we didn't deserve it, but God, because of your great love for us, you came for us, God. You gave of yourself for us, and so, God, we thank you, Lord. We don't take that for granted. Father, help us to live lives of humility, Father, because you are worthy. Worthy is the Lamb that was high and lifted up. You are worthy. And so, God, we thank you for this time. Worship team, if we can maybe go into that chorus one more time of worthy is, is the lamb. And as we go into this chorus, would you just as a sign to the Lord, if you feel comfortable, raise a hand to him and just begin to worship him. Just begin to thank him for his love and his mercy. Lord, a hand clap of praise this morning. Lord, we worship you. We thank you. We exalt you, Lord. And we thank you that we can come to this communion table together as a church family. And God, we don't take this moment for granted, but God, we thank you for it. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy. And God, thank you for church family, God, that we can be here and partake together to celebrate you. So Lord, bless the rest of the service, we pray. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. amen. Come on, give the Lord one more hand clap of praise this morning. Amen. Well, hey, before you're seated this morning, would you do me a favor? Look at the person next to you. Give them a wave. Say hello. Amen. Give, give them a quick compliment, and then you can go ahead and you may be seated this morning. Anthony, my brother, you're up. Come on up. Can you give it up for Mr. Anthony Clark as he comes up this morning, our resident Coast Guard officer? Officer? Yeah, officer, Coast Guard officer, Mr. Anthony this morning. Thank you, bro. All righty, good morning, good morning, church. How is everyone doing today? Good? Cool. All right, so welcome to CIAG, Cayman International Assemblies of God. And we're so glad that you're here with us. For those of you who may be at home, from the comfort of your home watching online, or those of you who are here in studio, we just want to thank you for joining us and uh, just enjoy the service today. Thank you for worshiping with us and giving God the time to just be here, you know, and just come together as a family. So as you enter the theater this morning, you should have noticed there's a table just as you entered. Uh, on that table, you have an envelope on it, and that is your sermon notes with the outline of the message today. Uh, inside of that, or right next to that, you should have received the, um, the connection card. Now, on that connection card, there is a QR code. So if you would like to be added to our WhatsApp CIAG family group, you can just scan that QR code. Or you can fill out the connection card. Just drop it in the bucket, which is just over here on your way out. And we will add you manually. And that just helps us with uh, any upcoming events or if you do need to get in contact with anyone, for example, like with the storm, you know, just to make sure everyone is fine, everyone is safe, you know, and just, you know, come together as a family and just keep an eye out for one another. You know, that's, that's what the group is really for. So just fill that out, drop it in the bucket, and we will get you signed up. 
Uh, I would like to bring your attention to two announcements this morning. Uh, the first one being we have a new series which starts this week, right? So September 5th, and the series is called Decisions Discovering, Discovering God's Direction, right? So that's a new series we're going to get into this week. And also Wednesday Morning Belong resumes at September 1st, right? So I know a lot of the guys, I've said this a few times, a lot of the guys are always jealous when the ladies come together because they have so much fun. It's always great fellowship. It's always great communion and edification. You know, just coming together and building up yourselves. Uh, Pastor Erica always has so much revelation to pour out. So ladies, if you missed the last season, just make sure that you're here this season for the new uh, Wednesdays Belong sessions and also the Saturday Breakfast Belongs, right? So right across on my right hand, side, right hand side on the theater next to me, we have the kids theater. That one is for the nursery. So if you're a toddler from ages one, I don't want to say zero, but under one, <laughs> under one up to ages four, you can just go to the nursery. And across the hall we have for the big kids, that is ages five to 10. Our kids, when we're about to dismiss you, Again, just meet at the very bottom of the stairs here. I will be teaching this morning, so just meet me down there. Don't run ahead. We just want to keep an eye on everyone uh, before you, you know, take off and get lost. So just meet me at the bottom. But now as we transition into the next part of the service, I would like you to just take a few minutes, just walk around, just greet one another, and uh, enjoy the service. Good morning, everybody. We can't see you because there's lights right in the eye, so we hope someone's there. Uh, Melissa? Uh, good morning, church. Every week, we have an opportunity to worship with our ties to God. Thank you for giving towards what the Lord is doing here at CIAG. We just want to take a moment and pray over every tither and giver at CIAG. At the end of the service, there will be ushers to collect all communication cards, <laughs> as well as your tithes and off offerings. Uh, you may have to leave the theater. Uh, when you leave the theater, you can put it in the popcorn bucket, as you saw before. Christopher? <laughs> if online giving is easier for you, please take a look at our announcement sheet for the ways to give online. And please keep in mind that if we are first-time guests, uh, you are under no obligation to give. We are glad you decided to join us today. 2 Corinthians 9.7 says, Let giving flow from your heart not from a sense of religious duty or obligation. It springs freely from the joy of giving, all because God loved us and our cheerful generosity. Let's pray. Father, truly we are your servants. 
In you we live and move and have our being. We offer you our thanksgiving and call on your name. We love you, Lord, for you hear us and respond in graciousness and compassion and righteousness. You deliver our souls from death, our feet from stumbling and our eyes from tears. Now receive our tithes and offerings. We pray, multiply them so that your work and word can go forth. Amen. Please, guys, take a look at the screen, and we have um, the new series, The Leading. Thank you. What should I do? I mean, there's so many options. I mean, you know what? I'm going to go with this one. What's the worst that could really happen? What? How did I get back here? Is this what I was supposed to do? Did I make the right decision? You know what? Let's let's try this one. Maybe maybe this is what I'm supposed to do. What is going on? I'm still ending up right back where I started? God, what am I supposed to do? All righty. Well, good morning, CIAG. It's wonderful to be with you again this morning. Chris and Melissa, you're right. It's very bright up here. <laughs> I wonder if this is what Jesus feels like, you know, surrounded by lights everywhere, you know. You ever think about that? Can Jesus, you know? <laughs> well, hey, for those that are visiting with us for the first time, welcome. It's such an honor and privilege to have you joining with us this morning. My name is Stephen. I am the pastor here at CIAG. I am missing my better half this morning because she is over at First Assembly, but she wishes she could be here with us this morning. And, uh, you know, she sends her love and she, uh, you know, she just wishes that she could be here with us this morning. She says hello. Uh, but she'll be back next week, so you'll have the better looking De Silva next week, all right? So don't fret. <laughs> well, what you just saw on the screen was just a, a simple little trailer, a simple little teaser of the series that we are starting next week. Anybody remember what it's called? Come on, say it like you mean it. Decisions, all right. Some of you are deciding whether or not you should speak up this morning, <laughs> right? <laughs> so decisions, decisions. You know, what do you do when you have to decide between two good options? right? What do you do when you have to decide between something that it doesn't have anything to do with morals, but maybe it has something to do with ethics? What do you, what do, you do when you have to decide and, and you have to figure out, okay, is this a good decision or is this a God decision? Just because something is good doesn't necessarily mean, doesn't always mean that it's what the Lord has for you. How many know that to be true, right? So we're going to, those are just kind of some thoughts, some ideas of what we're going to be looking at in this decision series that's coming up. Now it starts next Sunday. Now here's what I'm going to ask you to do today. I'm going to uh, mention it here at the beginning of the message, but also at the end of the message, I'll remind you, if everyone can please grab your sermon outline or your notes this morning, inside of there, there is a card that says decisions on it. It's a small group or a life group sign up card. I'm going to encourage everyone to do two things today, okay, two things. The first thing is to, I encourage you to fill out that card. Why am I going to ask you to fill out that card? Because church is not just about coming and, you know, singing a few songs and listening to someone speak. That's not what church is. Church is the body coming together. Can I get an amen this morning? The body, it's when we come together, right? When you, when you come together with me, I come together with you, we come together with one another, and we share what God is doing in our hearts and our lives with one another so that we can build each other up. That is the church. The church is the body of Christ. It's the community of Christ. So how do we connect with one another in a way that's authentic and real and is sustainable in the long run where we can really feel like we're building deep relationships? Through small groups. So we are expanding on our small groups. We currently have a small group on Wednesday evening, but for the next six weeks during the series, we are expanding the small groups for everyone in the church. So let me encourage you, please fill that card out, and then we will get you connected this week. 
one of our leaders will reach out to you to get you connected uh, and just kind of find out some more information about what works for you. So that's the first thing, fill out the card. And then the second thing, Davidson, I think you have, if you don't mind putting that graphic up of the shirts and the, the kits. Uh, oh, you already got it up. Man, can you give it up for Davidson? He's doing so good this morning. <laughs> our entire media and worship team and our kids team, we're so grateful. But behind me, you'll see those kits that I mentioned the last uh, last week where we have, as a part of this series, Decisions, we prepared a kit for you. Now, the kit is 20 CI. We priced it exactly at, at cost um, just to make it as affordable as we could for everyone. We had to ship the book in, the books in from the U.S. But what this is, this is a study guide. So as part of this study guide, I have an example here. What this study guide includes is it includes the weekly life group or the weekly small group topics that we'll be going through in small groups so everybody has a copy but not only that but it also has daily devotional thoughts for 40 days so this is something this is really a 40-day companion study guide book that we're asking everyone to pick up and not only do you get this book but you also get a a, a little t-shirt as well that has um, a proverb on there trust in the lord and all of your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. So they're available out in the lobby. You'll see Miss Kim out there right in the lobby. You'll see the red t-shirts in the table. I would encourage you to please grab one of those kits. If you don't have uh, cash with you today, or if you're saying, I would like to buy one, but I'm just, it's, you know, 20 CI may be a lot right now. Let us know, you know, we'll, we'll work with you to make sure that you're a part of it. We don't want anybody missing out on what the Lord is gonna do through this. Um, If you don't have, uh, finance the, the cash available today there's a little sign up sheet out there that you can put your information down with Miss Kim and we'll make sure to set your, your shirt size aside okay enough with these announcements huh <laughs> alright well today is the last day of our relationship series how many have been enjoying the relationship series so far today we're going to be looking at the power of community, the power of community. We're going to look at two passages today in Romans chapter 12 and Hebrews chapter 3. You know, there's a book, it's called Bowling Alone. It was written by by an author, his name is Robert Putman. And in this book, Bowling Alone, he identifies the number one need in the world today. It's really interesting. This is a big statement that he's making. The statement that he he believes is, is one of the greatest needs in the world today is loneliness someone say loneliness loneliness he even calls loneliness the new epidemic right you know it's interesting because we are more connected than we've ever been before we have social media we have whatsapp we have email we have phone numbers we have we are more connected than than ever you know we were you can you can communicate with someone on the other side of the world in a completely different time frame and yet we are so isolated. We are so connected, but so isolated, right? We are so lonely. What we have to understand before I pray this morning, what we have to understand is that the core of Christianity is love. The core of Christianity is love. Look at this verse with me. John chapter 13 and verse 34. This is Jesus speaking. You've heard me uses this verse multiple times but jesus says this he's talking to his disciples he's saying a new commandment i give you love one another can you say that with me love one another come on say it loud love one another he says love one another as i have loved you so you must love one another you see jesus gave us a command to obey this is a command right and then Paul, later on, he, he, he gave it to us in a different way. He says, honor one another. Can you say honor? Honor one another. He says to honor, to esteem, to recognize, to, to value, to let others have the praise, to, to build others up and to not tear down. Jesus says to love one another even above yourselves. And then he gave them a warning. And what he said was, if this doesn't happen, if you don't love one another, if you don't honor one another, then you and I will go through life without any deep or authentic relationship. And that's what we've been talking about these last four weeks. Today is, is the fourth week. How do we develop authentic relationships? Because this is what I'm going to tell you. 
You want to know what the secret to spiritual growth is? A secret essential to spiritual growth? Authentic community. Many of us think, man, I'm going to shave my head. I'm going to move to Tibet or Nepal. I'm going to go live in a, in a monastery in the mountains. I'm not going to speak for a year, and I'm going to be so close to God. <laughs> right? But if you and I become monks and we go to the other side of the world and we live in a monastery, we might be close to God, but we're not close to anyone else because we've isolated ourselves. And therefore, we think we're close with God, but God wants to work things out in us through others. You with me this morning? Would you bow your head with me this morning? And in this time, for the next several minutes as we look at this, at this message of the power of community, would you begin, would you, okay? I'll pray over you, but would you, in this moment, for the next 30 seconds, would you just speak to God and say, God, would you, would you speak to my heart? Lord, may your word become illuminated to me. Father, show me, Father, what it is that you desire to do in me. Would you begin to do that? Just begin to speak to God and say, God, I'm here. I'm ready to listen. I'm ready to receive from you, God. Speak to me through your word. And Father, as we're praying that this morning, we just ask you, Lord, that you would do exactly that, that your word would come alive in our hearts, in our minds, and in our lives, God. Lord, we love you. We thank you. Father, your word demands a response from us, God. So, Lord, help us to respond in a way, Father, that glorifies you. Lord, we love you. We thank you, God, that you desire the best for us. In Jesus' name, everyone said amen, amen. So on the way in, you should have grabbed your sermon notes. You can follow along there. You can also have a digital copy of the sermon notes by joining the WhatsApp group. Or you can follow along on the screen behind me. But today, we're going to be looking at the power of community. The power of community, right? It's kind of like horsepower, right? It's, there's, there's power behind it. When there's power behind something, it means it's, there's a purpose behind something. We said that if we want to grow spiritually, a secret essential, an essential element of growing spiritually is being an authentic community. Look at this passage with me, Romans chapter 12. In verses 9 through 13. Romans chapter 12 and verses 9 through 13. And this is what Paul says. Paul says, Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Before I continue, you know, you see that word there, hypocrisy, hypocrisy? It's interesting because this word, in ancient times, right, in the, in the theaters, the ancient Greeks, the, the ancients, right, in the theaters, there were actors on stage who wore masks to play different parts. So maybe for one scene, the actor is maybe a villain, so he puts on the mask of a villain. And then for another scene, maybe the actor is, I don't know, the damsel in distress, right? And then for the other scene, the, the, the actor plays another part, so he puts on a different mask, right? What was interesting, in these times, in these ancient times, they weren't called actors. They were called hypocrites. So a hypocrite is someone who puts on a mask, right? So what Paul is talking about here is he's saying there's no way that we could really love each other the way that Jesus commands us to love each other if we put on a mask, right? So we mentioned this in the first week of our relationship series. Why do we put on masks? Well, we put on masks to, preserve, to protect ourselves, to preserve ourselves because we're afraid of being hurt because we're afraid of being rejected, because we're afraid of being vulnerable, and therefore, as a response, we put on these masks, right? But what Paul is saying is, let love be without hypocrisy. Let love be without acting. Let love be without being fake. He says, abhor what is evil, but cling to what is good, right? Hold on to it. And then he tells us in verse 10 how to treat one another, right? He says, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor, not lagging behind in diligence, being fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, and practicing hospitality. You see, what Paul is telling us is that an authentic community, it's one that is connected together, that is loving, that joins together. And it's in that type of community that we bring honor and glory to God. 
Does anyone want to bring honor to God in their lives this morning? Amen? You see, let me tell you about this concept. There's this concept between rows and circles, okay? Someone say rows. Someone say circles, right? Now, this type of community that Paul is talking about, it doesn't happen naturally. You don't just wake up one morning and love everybody, right? (laughs) It just doesn't happen, right? So there's rows and there's circles. Now, this type of community doesn't happen in rows, okay? I know we're sitting in rows, but go with me, okay? (laughs) It doesn't happen in rows. But this is, is what we've experienced for years. We come in on Sunday morning. We, we sit down, we sit down, you know, next to each other, sh- shoulder to shoulder, but we don't know each other. Someone say, rows don't know. <laughs> if you want to grow spiritually, commitment isn't enough, but you must be connected. Commitment isn't enough. You've got to be connected. This is the whole point of why I'm asking you, of why we've been asking the church to join a small group, because this will take your personal relationship with God and your personal relationships with others to another level. It's a vehicle that God uses, these small group times. How you love God determines how you love people and how you treat people. But how you love and treat people determines how you love and treat God. Right? So one of the main values that we have here at CIAG is a value of connecting together as a church body. Let me tell you what our dream as a church is. Our dream as a church is, again, here's this phrase, authentic community, that we will be real, that we will be loving, we will be accepting, that anybody can come in to CIAG and feel like they're home, feel like they're, they're a part of a, of, of, a, of a family, feel like it doesn't matter what their background is, it doesn't matter what's going on in their life, that they will be loved. Now, we want to encourage people to grow in their relationship with Christ, Right? Because many of us, many of us are, might be newer Christians, and we're, we're still dealing with things in our lives, right? All of us, right? There's maybe certain things, certain lifestyles, certain patterns of behavior, whatever it is that we're dealing with that God is still working out. But can this be a place where people can find safety in relationship with one another, where we won't be judged, that people are not wearing masks, but it's a place that people can say, you know what, I'm not perfect. No perfect people allowed, right? I'm not perfect, but I'm growing in my relationship with God, and I'm growing in my relationship with others. Many times we, we want people to be, like, shiny and, you know, all polished and everything like that, nice hairstyle, and that, right? We want people to be shiny and perfect, but Jesus didn't say, the, the word doesn't say that when we got our act together, Christ came and died for us. No. The word says that while we were yet still sinners— While I was still sleeping around, while I was still addicted to this, while I was still this, God loved me so much that he sent his one and only son to die for me because of his great love. God loves me so much that he doesn't want me to stay stuck in this lifestyle. Can CIAG be a place where we can be authentic and real? And I believe we can. Because we are all imperfect, but we are growing, we are learning, we are following, we're submitting to Christ. And as we give Christ access to our lives, he'll do the work, man. He'll do the work. He'll do the work inside of our hearts and our lives. And then before you know it, we begin our lives show a pattern of transformation so that we begin to show the the character of Christ. Are you with me this morning? This is the power of authentic community. Imagine someone trying to do that alone. But when we do this together, saying, you know what, brother, sister, whatever, you know, we're on this journey together. I know you might have stumbled here. You might have did this. But, hey, I did that too in the past. But God is helping me through that. God taught me this. Let me, let me show you what God taught me. Let me show you this in the word. Let me show you a scripture that really encouraged me. Let me pray for you. Let me help you out. Let me meet you at your house. Let me do something, Right? This is authentic community. We are in community, but we are also creating community, right? Now, I said rows and circles, right? Th- this, this vision, this, this, this authentic community, it doesn't work in rows. <laughs> it doesn't work in rows. You know, it works in circles. Circles are better than rows. Can you say that? Circles are better than rows. There is so much more that can happen face-to-face than shoulder-to-shoulder. 
guys, I'm going to pick on us a little bit. So if you ever notice this, it's, it's, it's fascinating. <laughs> if you ever notice, maybe when you go out to brunch after church today or something like that, or next time you go to a restaurant, try to, try to pick it out. You, you might see what, what I'm talking about. If you look at a group of men and you look at a group of women sitting together, right, and they're talking, they're hanging out, usually the women, they're sitting and they're, they're kind of like facing each other. Even if they're sitting next to each other, when they talk, they, they like kind of turn their shoulders towards each other a little bit. But guys, you know, you might see a group of guys just sitting on a bar and they're just shoulder to shoulder, <laughs> right? Not to say guys don't communicate, I'm not saying that, but what I'm saying is it's interesting because many times the person who's sitting right next to you may not know what's going on in your life. They don't know what you're really thinking. They don't know what you're really feeling, right? But when you're, you're, you're able to be face-to-face with someone, then you each have an understanding of what's going on with each other, right? There is so much more that can happen when we're face-to-face. Why is authentic community so important? And these are our, our points for today. Why is it so important? Look at this, this passage. I'm going to read from Hebrews chapter 3. I'm going to walk through some of these verses. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 12. Why is this so important? Why are we taking four weeks to talk about this and then going into small groups? Why is this so important? Paul says it this way, chapter 3, verse 12 in Hebrews. He says, see to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that what? Turns away from the living God. So what Paul is urging us as believers, as followers of Christ, is to make sure, someone say make sure, is to make sure that nobody turns away because of an unbelieving heart. What makes an authentic community so powerful? Here's your first blank. We can all drift. We can all drift. We all can drift. We drift, right? We drift from that which we know God is doing in our lives, from that which is holy or wholesome or healthy. We can drift from that if we're not careful, if we're not intentional. It's funny, human nature, if it's good for us, we can drift from it, right? Our exercise, (laughs) our diet, (laughs) our budgets, our healthy relationships, right? We can drift from it, right? Our relationship with God, we can drift from it. Man, the current of life, right? Like a river, the current of life, it rarely takes us in the right direction, right? It's almost like we're swimming upstream. We have to fight against the current, right, with our relationships, with our kids, with our spouses, with God, etc. And the thing with drifting is we never plan to drift. Think of a boat, right, when you drive down the waterfront. Think of all the boats out there. The, 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 the boat captains, they don't go out there and say, okay, I'm just going to, you know, park the boat, place the boat right here. Don't worry about the anchor. I really want to end up there, so I'm, I'm not going to put the anchor down. I'm just going to park here and let myself drift over there. Who does that? No one does that, right? If you want to go where you want to go, once you get there, lower the anchor because the anchor will prevent you from what? From drifting, all right? That's why in the book of Hebrews it says that this hope is an anchor for the soul. That's why we are messengers of hope. We must be filled with the hope of Christ filled with the hope that God is doing something in us and through us because that will ground us. It will keep us where we need to be, right? Great relationships, great marriages, they don't just happen naturally. We must be intentional. Can someone say intentional this morning? We have to let people in, okay? (laughs) We have to let people in. We haven't been called to, to swim alone, but together. This is the power of community. Together with people who share your values, together with people who share your convictions, surround yourself with people who will challenge and inspire you to grow. So let's look at our verse again, Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 12. Paul says, see to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful or unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. He uses the term turns away. Why would someone turn away? Who would turn away? All of us, this is what Paul is saying. Paul is saying is that if there's not something in our lives that will prevent us from turning away, we just have a default of walking away from things that we know are good for us, right? Why do we turn our back on God? You see, the turning away that Paul is talking about, you know where it takes place? It takes place in our hearts. That's what he's saying. An unbelieving heart that turns away from God. The turn happens in the heart. The drift begins within. The drift 
begins within. And, and unless no one knows, if no one is seeing in, if no one has access to your life, it's going to be hard to prevent that drift. Why? Because rows don't know. Circles are better than rows. Why? Because rows don't know. Rows don't know about the questions in your mind right now. Rows don't know about how you're questioning your own relationship with God. Rows don't know about how you're questioning, am I wasting my time going to church in the morning? Rows don't know what you're struggling with. Rows don't know what's going on with your kids or, or, or with that, that, that passionate conversation you had with your spouse this morning, right? If you catch my drift. <laughs> Rows don't know about what's going on, Right? Rows don't see the drifting heart. They don't have access to you. We are so good at putting on the mask and withholding the truth from others. And here's the danger of this. When nobody knows what's going on in our lives, when we don't let anyone in, we begin to isolate ourselves to our problems and become a greater target for the enemy to attack in our lives. Look at what Paul says in verse 13. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 13, Paul says, But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today. If today is called today, today is a day of encouragement. Amen? <laughs> if today is still today, encourage someone. Encourage someone to, to draw closer to God, to, to desire the best for them, right? A healthy community. What does a healthy community do? The second thing. A healthy community provides encouragement, which leads to spiritual growth. A healthy community provides encouragement, which leads to spiritual growth. You know, this word that Paul uses, encourage, it, it means to, to appeal to someone, to exhort them, to, to implore them, to entreat them, to, to urge strongly, right? To strongly urge, to beg, it even means. Paul is saying, let me beg you to keep growing because this is so important. This is what Paul is saying. He's saying speak to each other's attitudes to be in their life, to say something when you see something, right? Remember that commercial years ago? It said uh, friends don't let friends do drugs, right, <laughs> or one of those. If you see something, say something. Hey, man, you know, I, you know, this might not be any of my business, but I just want to, you know, I just want to tell you, I, I the way you spoke to your wife was a little harsh the other day. Are you guys okay? Is there any, can I pray for you guys? What's going on? But if you don't give someone access to do that, if you don't let someone close enough to speak into your life, those things are just going to keep happening. This is so important because when we have authentic community, that wife doesn't have to struggle alone. That couple doesn't have to struggle alone. Those teenagers, that family at home doesn't have to struggle alone. When something goes wrong in your life, in my life, does someone know it? Does someone have access to it? Does someone have, you ready, permission to say something? When someone sees something that's going on, is someone close enough to see it? Do they have permission to say something. Man, think of how different things might have been in our lives if, if, if we lived in a circle and not in a row mentality. Rows don't know because these things don't show up in a row. Today, Paul says, as long as today is called today, we need this encouragement. You know, I grew up personally, I grew up in a home where we really didn't have a lot of people come over. Um, you know, I, it just wasn't really normal for us where people would just come over and just hang out at the house all day. And not to say we didn't like people coming over. It's just that just wasn't normal, right? So as I got older and, and as I became a teenager and I came to the Lord, I, I was a part of different small groups, you know, with other teenagers and whatnot. And, and I had Christian friends around me. And uh, to, to this day, a, a, a small group of us, we still get together to this day. We call it friends of us. We, we try to go somewhere around the world and we try to get together during, during Christmas. But when Eric and I, uh, along with my older sister, this was before we were married, we noticed that our friends, we all went to church on Sunday morning, and we were all kind of connected with each other, but we were disconnected. You know what I mean? 
we would only see each other every once. You know, in school, you're growing up, you're together, but then you go to college, you separate, everyone goes on their career path, people move away, et cetera. You're kind of you're disconnected at that point in different stages of life. So we realized that this group of friends that we grew up with, that we are close-knit with, now we're not so close-knit. So then we thought, okay, well, let's, let's just have the group over. Let's have people over for, you know. So my sister and I were living together at that point, and so we opened up our house, and Pastor Erica came, and our friends came over. And, but it was in those settings, in that small group setting. Yeah, we would come, we would hang out, we'd play games, have food, right? How many are grateful for food during small groups, right? <laughs> right? You have food, you hang out. Uh, but then you, you, you look at a teaching, you look at a scripture, something that, that you're able to grow on together, right? Not just physical food, but spiritual food, right? You come together, you read the word of God, you do a teaching, you do a topic, and it's in those settings that these people that I knew for years, I grew up with for years, over 10 years, I began to see different sides of them. It's crazy. You can know someone for years, but there are still aspects of someone's life that you don't know because if they don't give you access to that, if, that, if the environment isn't conducive to that, then we just won't know, right? We can become so busy with our lives that we, you know, all we see is, is the other parents at, at the soccer games, or that's as far as we see them, right? But when we come together, we are able to see different aspects of our life. Why did I share that story? I share that story because I had to learn personally how to make community part of my new normal. Right, because before it was just I'm just living my life, doing what I wanna, what I want to do. But then I realized that outside of community, when I'm not close with others, when I'm not letting people speak in, when I'm not letting people encourage, when I'm not letting people care for me, you know, sometimes it's hard for us to receive care because we're the ones that's doing all the caring. Does that make sense? Right. A lot of times it's hard for us to receive care. Right. Oh, because we're we're the strong ones. Right. <laughs> When I learn to receive it, when I learn to let people in, when I learn to be vulnerable, there's so much that God does in those moments. So that's what I had to learn. I had to learn that it, 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 I had to open up my life to others. I needed to learn how to give people access to my life. Look at this as we continue. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 13. Paul says, encourage one another so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. So that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. What's interesting is the wording that he uses. He uses the word hardened by sin's deceitfulness. There are times when we're in a drift. We're drifting away from our relationship with God. Right? We don't notice the drift because the drift happens within. We're drifting away from our relationship with God. What we do is we deceive ourselves. Many of us go to church, but not a lot of us go to Christ. And there's a difference. Christ is found in the word. Christ is found in authentic community. God uses community to refine us, to bless us, to correct us, and to keep us. Now follow me. Paul uses the word hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Sin is deceitful. We think that we're good with God, and we can still live our lifestyle the way that we're living it. Right? That's deceit. That is the deceit of sin. I will serve God and follow God and obey God as long as it falls under the way that I want to do it, <laughs> right? Partial obedience is not obedience at all. And that's the hard truth. But when that truth is delivered in love, saying, you know what? There's a greater purpose for your life than the deceitfulness of the sin. Paul uses the word hardened. Scripture talks about this concept of our, of our, of our conscience being seared like a steak right picture of steak being put on a hot uh, grill it just sears when when our conscience is seared it means that the things that used to bother us the things that we once knew were wrong there we we've rationalized it at this point we've developed this crust this this in hardening in 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 our minds around this thing around this lifestyle that we've justified our way we've rationalized it away and next thing you know we're up a creek without a paddle we've drifted right but when someone can come in and say, you know what, I know for whatever reason you're here, but God's got something better for you. God loves you too much to let you stay this way. And it's not just about changing others. You follow me? It's about being in a place where we're open to receive it. Are you with me this morning? 
I know I'm rambling. Please forgive me. Point three. Number three. <laughs> community, right? Community, it protects us from the deceitfulness of sin. From the deceitfulness of sin, right? We were all created with a sinful nature, right? Because we are born into a fallen world, our natural default is to is is a bend towards sin away from god right the more we feed our sinful desires the more we feed these lusts and these cravings the more it grows right but the more that we starve it the more it shrinks and you can overcome it it's kind of like the starving the sumo concept okay picture a big 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 sumo wrestler in your mind for a minute okay big sumo wrestler and imagine you fighting the sumo wrestler, <laughs> right? Some of us may be larger, some of us may be smaller, but pretend that this sumo wrestler is huge, right, in front of you. There's no way that you in your own strength can take down this sumo wrestler. They're just, they're much bigger than you, they're stronger than you, they're smarter than you, whatever it is, right? There's no way we can defeat them. So what do you do? You starve the sumo. <laughs> starve the sumo. If you don't feed it, it won't grow. And then it gets to a point where you can overpower it. What you feed will lead your life. That's what I'm trying to say. What you feed will lead your life. If you're struggling with alcoholism, stop hanging out with people who drink. <laughs> if you're struggling with lust, stop watching movies and things that trigger you. If you're struggling with controlling your words and with what you say, stop hanging out with gossips and people who tear others down. Right? What you feed will lead. If you feed on the word of God, if you feed on his presence, if you feed on community with people, that will lead your life. What you feed will lead. Sin deceives us. This is what Paul is saying. Sin deceives us. It's not just something that we do, but because of our default nature, it, it, sin is almost like it's, it's almost in us in a way. It deceives us. It's very deceptive because it makes us, what, deceive ourselves. The power of community is this. It helps to prevent us from deceiving ourselves. How do we deceive ourselves, right? It's not just some little voice. It's not like the angel and the demon right on the shoulders. It's not that. It's what we tell ourselves, right? It's what we talk ourselves into doing, right? It's the self-talk. What I'm trying to say and what Paul is saying here is that the best defense is not you, it's not me, it's we. Can I get an amen this morning? We is the best defense against sinfulness, the, deceitful, the deceitfulness of sin. Rows don't know how you're talking to yourself right now. Circles will know. The circle, the community, those that you've given access into your life, they'll know. Look, Paul mentions it. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 11. Paul says this. He says, no one really knows what anyone else is thinking or what he was really like except that person himself. Do you see that? The reality is, if we don't give people access, you and I can be deceived. So my question for us this morning is this. What are you telling yourself today? What have you been telling yourself these last couple of days, these last couple of weeks, these last couple of months? You know, she always does this, or why do we always have to do it like this? Or what have you begun to tell yourself? What is the narrative that you keep replaying in your mind? That thought, <laughs> you ready for this? That thought, if you were to tell that thought to someone else, would they think you've lost your mind? <laughs> would they think you're crazy? Many of us never really tell people what we're really thinking. Because if we told them, they would think we'd lost our mind. Guys, maybe you're about to get into a relationship you know you shouldn't be in. Maybe you're about to make a major decision in your life that will affect several different things. And you're not telling anybody about that decision because you don't want anyone to challenge you or to question you on it. When we begin to hide things in our lives, that's a warning sign. It's not to bring shame. It's not to bring condemnation. But it's a warning sign because deceitfulness is around the corner. We deceive ourselves. Guys, I was like that. I was like that where I, I, would, I, would, I had to learn how to let people in. What do I mean by that? What I mean is I had to let people know what I was thinking and what I was doing because pride was getting a hold of me, because I thought I'm just going to figure it out on my own. 
I don't need anyone else. Of course, I didn't say that aloud, but in my heart of hearts, you know what I mean? Like, you, you just know that. And so I had to, when I, when, when I came to Christ and, and, and community started to, to, to really take place in my life, I started to see, man, I've been deceiving myself. There, to the point where it's <laughs> pretty ridiculous at this point, where I'll, I'll let people know about the smallest things that I'm thinking right now. <laughs> and they're like, you don't have to tell me, just do it, right? Like <laughs> just because that's a safeguard, that's a guardrail that I've developed in my own life, because before I would just move and tell you later. But that could be pride if it's not dangerous, right? Man, I remember a friend of mine, w- man, telling me one time, you know, Steve, if you go down this path, we were sitting at lunch, I'll never forget it, said, Steve, if you go down this way, I think it'll destroy your life. And I remember going home and thinking, God, I, I, that's not what I wanted to hear, <laughs> right? But I'm so grateful that I heard it. It's the power of community, right? A lot of times we don't want to hear it because it's not what we want to do. But God has created us with a need for relationship, for protection. There was a quote I came across, and the quote says this. It says, prevention is better than cure. Anyone ever heard that before? I thought it was fascinating. Prevention is better than cure. So what he's saying is that it's better to stop something bad from happening than it is to deal with it after it's happened, right? Many times we'll say, oh, I'll just deal with it when it happens. I'll just, I'll deal with it when we get there. Okay, but maybe there's certain things that if we approach in that way, it's very unwise. Before you know it, if we're not careful, we'll convince ourselves into doing it. This is the deception of sin. Look at this as we get ready to close. Proverbs chapter 17 and verse 17. Proverbs says this. Proverbs says, a true friend is always loyal, and a brother is born to help in the time of need. And then Paul goes on to say in 1 Timothy, and he writes this. He says, 1 Timothy 3, chapter 14 to 15. Paul says, I am writing these things to you so that you will know how to live in the family of God. That family is is the church of the living God, the support and the foundation of the truth. If you tell them, they'll tell you you've gone crazy. Don't go that way, (laughs) right? That's a good place to be in. Here's the power of this. Potentially self-destructive thoughts they, they take place in all of our lives. But when someone is able to speak into that, even if you don't follow their advice, even if, they, even if you end up not listening to them, if you at least give them access and permission to your life to be able to speak into your life, you might see it differently. They can help us from doing things that we know will damage us, will we'll damage our relationship with Christ, will damage our relationship with others. Imagine if you had been in a circle, if someone had been there for you, or maybe for your your father or your mother. What if your brother had someone? What if your your ex-husband, your ex-wife had someone, or or, or for you? What if you had a circle? This is what authentic Christianity is about. It's found in love. Love protects, love perseveres, and love endures. This is the power of community. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 14 Paul says this, Hebrews 3, 14, he says, We have come to share in Christ if we hold firmly till the end the confidence that we had at first. So why are circles important? Why are small groups important? Number four, because community helps us to hold firmly to our convictions. Hold firmly to our convictions. The drift begins within. So let someone in. When you hold firmly... Think about when you first came to Christ. Man, you held firmly onto your relationship with him, onto the word of God. Paul is talking about the the confidence that we had at first, right? Hanging on to the original. Because what Paul is saying here, the the, the danger is that when the drift begins within, if it goes unchecked, it leads to unbelief. But what you believe what you believe determines how you think, and how you think leads to what? How you act, how you behave. Maybe that's your story this morning. You started and then you drifted. Maybe you went off to college. I don't know, you left home, you got to working, you met some friends, you met a girl, you met a guy, whatever, you took a job. Something happened to you, you made a decision. But before you know it, you've drifted away from God. 
The key is to hold on to that original conviction. How do we do that? Don't be tricked by the deceitfulness of sin. How do I do that? How do I not be tricked then? By being in relationship with God and with others who will be able to speak into your life. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 24 and 25, Paul says it this way. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Verse 25, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. You see, people are already doing. What Paul is saying here is that people, it's kind of like when people say, I love God, but I hate the church, right? The church is part of God's plan, (laughs) right? So Paul is saying, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. When Christ is coming, that's the day he's talking about. All the more, Christ is coming back. As you see that day coming closer, let us all the more encourage one another. Paul says, encourage one another. See to one another. He's saying, guys, circle up. Get into each other's lives. Ask each other these questions. Because when you are are drifting, when you begin to drift, when we begin to drift, we're not thinking about walking away. But if we continue to drift, next thing you know, the coast gets further and further and further, and and then you're lost at sea, right? Someone can see what you can't, what I can't. They either will or they will not have access to you, but you are the one that determines the amount of access you give to others in your life. People who care for you, people who love you, people who want the best for you. And mind you, it's not just about us, but it's about us, you and I, being that type of person for someone else. Not only do we let people in, but we're able to take the first step in caring and connecting and say, hey, how are you doing? Hey, I noticed, you know, I haven't seen you in church a couple weeks or whatever. You know, I've I've sent you some calls or texts. I I noticed you haven't replied back. Is everything okay? How are you doing? How's how's your husband? How's your wife? How's your kid? How are you doing? How's things going? Right? Really caring for One of our purposes here at CIAG is this, is to help you find and form biblical friendships, deep friendships. Man, we want everyone in a circle to engage in a group. So like what Paul says at the beginning, I want to encourage you. I want to appeal to you. I want to exhort you. I want to strongly urge you. I want to even beg you. (laughs) Get in a circle. So I mentioned the two action steps for us today. The first action step is to take that card, that decisions card, fill it out, join a small group, try it. Just try it for six weeks and see what the Lord does. Fill that card out. And as a part of it, we have the kit for you to join in the lobby as well. But what I want us to do, I know this wasn't a very, very deep, very profound theological message this morning, but I pray That it was a message that we could apply immediately to our lives. How many know it's not good to hear something and then not do anything with it, right? We've got to take the word and apply it to our lives. Would you bow your head with me this morning? And I just want us to, to pray and ask the Lord to prepare our hearts for community. I know for me personally, I didn't know it. Uh, or I didn't realize it, I should say, but I needed to be prepared for community. My heart needed to be in a place where the pride in my heart needed to be rooted out. And maybe that's where you're at today, saying, uh, it's a nice message and all, it's a nice topic and all, but that's not for me. Would you talk to God about that? And so God, we come before you today and we ask you, Lord Jesus, that you will prepare our hearts community, God. And Lord, I pray even before we continue in this prayer, Lord, if there's any of us here this morning that we don't have a relationship with you, we don't even have a a, a community with you, God. We we don't have that, that relationship, that closeness with you. Lord, I pray that you would minister to us. Jesus, like we took communion this morning, Lord, I thank you that you came down. Lord, you left heaven, you came to earth, and you paid the price for our sins, God. So Lord, I pray that if there's any of us here this morning that we would just commit our hearts and our lives to you, 
that you would forgive us of our sins, our transgressions, our iniquities. Lord, that you would help us to walk in right relationship with you. Lord, that you would help us to, to, to follow you as the leader and the Lord of our lives, that we would give you access. And Lord, as a part of that, we ask that you would help us, God, during this journey, during these next six weeks. Lord, I pray that during these times of small groups, as we fill out the cards and we turn them in at the end, Father, I pray that your spirit would be so present in these times and these meetings, meetings together, God. Lord, that it wouldn't be just be a time where we, we look at your word while there's so much value, but God, it would be a time of genuinely connecting together, laughing together, joking around together, crying together, celebrating together, mourning with each other, whatever it might be, God, that we would be able to live life in a circle and not in a row. So God, would you help us? Would you prepare our hearts personally for that, Father? For the great work that you desire to do in and through us, Father. Lord, we love you, we thank you, and we praise you. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen, amen. Can you give the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning? Now, I want to encourage you, if you haven't filled out that card yet, um, do so now. Go ahead and fill out that card, and then on the way down, you can go ahead and drop those, those uh, life group sign-up cards in the, in the bucket. And we'll give you a call this week, and we'll make sure to, to connect you, and we'll work with your schedule and let you know what's available as we, as we go into these six weeks. So let me encourage you, next week we begin the series, six weeks long. It's going to be a great, great series on how do we make godly decisions. How can we discern the difference between what's good and what's God? Amen? Now, before Chris and Melissa come, you know, I spoke this morning on the power of community and the importance of knowing what's going on in each other's lives, right? So uh, I want to let you know what's going on in our lives and let you know <laughs> that we are welcoming a new member to CIAG, the CIAG family. <laughs> so they'll be here in March. So please feel free to welcome them. <laughs> Not them. It's one, okay? It's just one. Him or her, let me just say that. Woo! So, <laughs> David Silva coming March 2022. Erica is over in um, First Assembly, so we're making, we, we're like, oh, man, we got to make the announcement on the same day, so both, both churches hear it. So you heard it here first. You can say you heard it here first, right? <laughs> but uh, it's a part of what's going on in each other's lives. We celebrate with one another. We walk through milestones in each other's lives, and this is a blessing from the Lord, and we're so grateful to him, and we just ask that you'll continue to keep us in prayer. And uh, just another, as a side note as well, um, so Erica's sister, funny enough, Erica's sister, her name is Annalise, today, this morning, she had her baby this morning, right before her service this morning, but please continue to keep them in prayer because she actually has covid um, but she's, uh, she's in the hospital, she's doing well, mama's doing well, baby's doing well, and so the doctors felt that it would be safer to just go ahead and do, do a C-section to take the baby. So it's Annalise and Demi is the name of the baby. Thank God they're doing well, but please, uh, you know, just personally, as part of this community, that's my prayer request to you, please keep them in, in your prayers, okay? Well, I'll ask everyone to stand. Chris and Melissa, if you can please come and lead us in our closing prayer. Oh, yes, yes, of course, for sure. Okay, well, what we, school, okay, so we want to take a moment and pray for the uh, for the kids that are going back to school. School is starting soon, right? Is it this Monday, tomorrow? Tomorrow, oh, man, okay. Well, if the kids are here, I don't know if we want to have the kids maybe just come to the front or um, if that's easier. If not, we could just go ahead and, and, and the teachers, right, the kids and the teachers. We definitely want to pray for, for both sets. Can you give it up for our kids and our teachers? going back to school and being a light in their schools. All right, guys. All right. Well, would you just stretch a hand towards the, the kids? And if you're a teacher here this morning as well, let's stretch our hands towards them. Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for these precious lives, for these precious individuals. And Lord, we just ask that you would bless them, that you would cover them, that you would go with them. 
in the name of Jesus, Lord, we ask that you would protect them physically, emotionally, mentally, Lord, that they would have a tremendous year of school, that they would learn, they would grow, they would grow into their fullest potential this year. Bless them as they go. We ask for your favor and your grace upon the students and upon the teachers of this house, Lord, and we thank you for their lives. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. All right, guys. Amen. 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 Here you come. Man, I need to be excited like that too. <laughs> okay, everyone, please stand and let's say our closing prayer. So repeat after us. Father, help us to be the people and the church. The people and the church. You called us to be. You called us to be. A people that always build up. A people that always build up. And never tear down. And never tear down. A people that always encourage. A people that always encourage. And never discourage. And never discourage. A people and a church. A people and a church. That take a message of hope. Take a message of hope. Everywhere we go. Everywhere we go. To everyone we meet. To everyone we meet. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yay, Jesus. Have Woo. a great week, church.